Good morning. How is everyone? Let's start again. How is everyone? Okay, good, good. I'm Lee Colson. I'm uh, director of the uh, LaunchNet at uh, Lorain County Community College. Uh, we have changed our name from LaunchPad to LaunchNet, the Neo LaunchNet. Uh, this uh, Phoebe is a, in conjunction with three entities on this campus, uh, Neo LaunchNet, uh, SBDC, and Glide. And we're brought to you uh, by uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts uh, franchisee is David Sisson. Uh, he's been with, with us since uh, we started back in July of 2013. So we appreciate all uh, that he has done. We would ask that you uh, go uh, buy uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts if you're ever uh, hungry for a, a, a quick sandwich or thirsty for some good coffee. Uh, drive through. He has one across the street from the campus. He also has one on West 150th and also in uh, Amherst on 58th. And when you drive by, just say uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for uh, supporting Phoebe. We appreciate it uh, on that. Uh, and as a result, he has saved us thousands of dollars because when we had this idea to come up with a Phoebe, we put in uh, a, uh, a request of the College Foundation. And <coughs> It was around, the request was around $7,500. And the reason for that was for the coffee for every week. Now, I realize that we would, be, would have been purchasing the coffee from the, the college because we're required to, you know, order from our own. And so $7,500, when you think about it, that's a lot of money. Well, he has saved us uh, so much because the foundation turned us down and said, we're not giving you money for, for coffee. Uh, and uh, so we went, uh, went uh, looking for other money. Uh, today we have an interesting uh, fellow with us, uh, Gary Medved. Uh, he uh, is, I would say, probably a typical entrepreneur. Uh, and he has a good story to tell. I'm not going to... Uh, explain anything more, I'll just let him go to it. Gary, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> First of all, thank you for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, tell my story as well as um, give some food for thought for the budding entrepreneurs out there. Um, my name is Gary Medved. If you Google that name, there's only one that comes up. That is me. There's one other name that comes up, Gary Medved, um, about the effects of bungee jumping in a thong. <laughs> Not me. Not me. Um, interestingly enough, the guy that wrote the article or the piece uh, made up the name. And he tells that at the end of it uh, and how he ever happened upon my actual name, I don't know. Because I can assure you, I never bungee jumped. I don't own a thong, and I would never put the two together if I, <laughs> if I did. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, mechanical engineer from Penn State, 1983, a long time ago. Um, John Carroll, MBA in 1997. This is after I got my career started at Goodyear, and I left there. I was designing machines, traveling around, having a good time seeing the world. Um, so I left an $8 billion company to sign on in with a small company in Chagrin Falls called Millbar Tool, which later became Stride Tool, and they were doing about $8 million a year. And what a rude awakening that was for me. Um, you could get lost in the uh, rounding error if you make a mistake at Goodyear for the amount of business they were doing. So we were designing machines and we had a lot of trial and error and some, some items would work, other items wouldn't work. Um, we always used to say it cost us $50 to change the design on paper, it cost uh, $500 to change it in the machine shop and it cost us $5,000 to change it once it got out in the manufacturing plant. There are a lot of mistakes that a lot of engineers made but it was trial and error. And in engineering school they take, teach you F equals MA and you cannot push a rope. And good, you're a tire and rubber, you're always pushing a rope. Um, Stride Tools, a small hand tool company, it was named Millbar, later bought out by the daughter of the owner of Millbar, became Stride. I joined as an engineer, became VP of New Business Development, had a lot of ideas for new products. Uh, we started designing them. 
introducing them. They started doing well. They promoted me, promoted me all the way up to president. And then I tried to buy the company. And um, they said no. So a year later, I tried to buy the company, and they said no. So I quit and bought my own company called um, Rotodie. And I think it was right around the time when I was at Stride Tool, the entrepreneurial spirit really started kicking in for me. I realized that um, I started to realize I really didn't want to work for a large corporation. Uh, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of layers of management. Um, not that it's good or bad, it just wasn't what I was looking for. When I was at Millbar, I was 50 feet from the owner's office. I could walk in there at any time. He would walk in my office. And we had a really strong relationship. He let me try a lot of new things, introduced a lot of new products, and it really worked out well for, uh, for both of us. A lot of those products still hang on the shelves of Sears, uh, Home Depot. Uh, if you, any of you own a pair of wire cutters or strippers for electrical wire, chances are they were made in Solon, Ohio. Uh, and three of them have my name on a patent, depending on which pair you're going to buy. Rotodye was a company that manufactured um, hydraulic sheet metal bending equipment for architectural roofing panels, uh, HVAC duct work. We sold a Viking appliance, uh, Boeing. It was a 45-year-old brand name when I bought it. The company was in turmoil. It had been bought and sold, bought and sold, stripped of all the value, really. They, one private equity group after another would buy it and just strip out layers of overhead, whatever. So I really got it on the cheap in 2007. It took me three months to realize why I got it so cheap. And um, that's where the work really kicked in because the brand name had been tarnished, had been beat up, nobody trusted it. Uh, the distributor network out there didn't trust it. So it was a lot of cleanup for the first two years. Over the ensuing years, we managed to build up sales about five times what they were when I bought the company. And then in early 2013, I was approached by an international company that had all the pieces in sheet metal bending except the piece that I had. So they bought me out. Um, talked to my wife about it. I probably wasn't going to get a better offer at any time soon. And I had a, mu a multitude of things going on in my life at that time. Uh, with Rotodai, um, I started a beer company while I owned Rotodai with a rock band from Pittsburgh. If anybody's familiar with Donny Iris, you may have heard his music. Uh, it was really big back in uh, the 80s when Michael Stanley was really big here in uh, Cleveland. So I'm good friends with the band. Um, they had this idea to start a light beer named after his moniker, King Cool. Uh, Rolling Stone tagged him with that name back in the early 80s when their big hit, Aliyah, hit, and they were all over the airwaves. And uh, still, I think the most played video on MTV was their Aliyah video. Well, they had this idea to take, come up with a light beer called King Cool Light. Um, so as you can see with my previous experience, I was the perfect guy for developing a beer <laughs> and <laughs> joining with a rock band to promote it. Um, so I talked to the guys. We met, we met at a restaurant uh, down in Beechwood, talked for a while. And I said, well, let me have samples of the beer. You know, I thought they had this thing, because they sent me a presentation, had a six pack, all the artwork was done. And I'm like, oh, they're just looking for somebody to just manage the company and go with it. And well, we don't have a beer. Well, you have a recipe. Well, no, we don't have a recipe. You have a brew. We don't have a brewer. We don't have a recipe. We don't have a, we have nothing just the idea and a, a presentation with some pretty ga graphics on it. Um, why I ever decided to do it, I don't know. I think it was just the allure of going to a lot of free rock shows and meeting other rock bands and stuff like that. And it was pretty fun. Um, so I was involved with that for three years, and I backed out uh, to start the company I'm going to talk about today or the restaurant I'm going to talk about today. Um, so through all of that, uh, the patents come and go. There are design patents. I got a number of patents at Goodyear Tire and Rubber, but they don't... Uh, publish those. Uh, they call them trade secrets because they don't want Michelin and Firestone to learn about them. So there's a number of them down there. But through all of this, it's been business development, it's been entrepreneurial, and it's been looking at opportunities. Uh, something that hasn't been done uh, that I wanted to do or present a marketing opportunity, whatever it may have been. Um, you've probably seen on the email, um, I, I've said this a thousand times since I started this program. Uh, the idea is always the easiest part, and I don't know if, I'm sure most of you watch Shark Tank on Friday nights. Uh, Mark Cuban mentioned that quite a few times on that show. Um, it's the work that you got to put into it afterwards. So I have all these ideas, and I used to have a file, actually I still have the file with all these ideas I've had, and, I, and you know, which ones I want to go after, and it's one of these things you got to pick where you're going to put all your resources. And the one we're going to talk about today was the one that won out on me. Um, 
ideas are born out of different uh, uh, avenues. Necessity, you can look around you in the world today, there are many ideas that are out there born out of necessity. Now, for me, it was when I worked for these other companies, we had a need for a product, or a customer came to us and we said, you know what, we're putting these, uh, we're doing this catheter work on patients, but when we put the catheter up, up inside their leg, we need a tool to do this. Well, there was a need for that, so we would design something, develop something, never been done before, wound up getting a patent on it. Um, then you have the passion, okay? I go down, I live in Lyndhurst, I go down Mayfield Road and I see all these new businesses that are open, born out of passion more than anything. Um, you might have somebody that loves to make Italian food and they want to open up a restaurant to make Italian food. That's great. The big thing is 90% uh, of restaurants go out of business within a few years because they're all undercapitalized. They're passionate about what they're doing, their food tastes great, but they don't have the money to keep it going until the brand name catches. And for every mouth you feed, you're pulling them out of another restaurant. Then there's the better way approach. Uh, think Amazon, okay? No longer, well, another five years, probably most of us won't be getting in our car to do any shopping whatsoever. You know, whether it's toiletries, perishables, uh, gifts for birthdays, Christmas, whatever it may be. Uh, you all heard that they're experimenting with drones and everything else. These guys have taken it to another level. They, where they manufacture paper towel in this, in this country under Procter & Gamble, Amazon now is setting up shop inside those factories. They've got two guys and a computer. When the paper towel is made, they put it on a special section of shelving just for Amazon. When you order paper towel through Amazon, they pull it off the shelf with whatever place it's been manufactured. They slap a label on it and they ship it to you. Okay? They are completely cutting out the middleman, completely. And the next, next thing you're going to be going after is the FedEx, the UPSs of the world, the postal system, because delivery is by far next for Amazon. That's their better way. Uh, and then there's market opportunity. Uh, this, this is where a lot of mine fall in, especially what we're going to talk about today. You just see things out there going on, and it's like, you know what? This niche has not been filled, okay? And then you come up with the idea, which again is the easiest part, and then filling that niche, which is most likely the hardest part. Um, I call this the separation effect. And I, I, I'm married, uh, I've dated my wife for six years, we've been married for over 30 years. And when I approached her about this idea, she was like, Gary, go do it. She's a nuclear engineer. She was like not into the restaurant thing. She's as much into food as I am being a mechanical engineer. I say, Kim, it's gonna take all, Gary, go do it. Kim, it's gonna take, Gary, go do it. Kim, it's gonna take, go do it. So I did it. Um, and that was like six years ago when I started the development process. The amount of time, energy, money, sleep, sanity that you put into the birth of an idea to get it where, where we are today, three and a half years in since launch, uh, you really, you can measure the dollar value, but you can't measure everything else that goes with it. All you know is that at some point in time, you're, you just feel exhausted, you're putting in super long hours, super long days, you're running around, picking up supplies here, bringing them in, trucking them up steps if the elevator's broke, you're doing all these little crappy things to make your business successful. But they all come under the separation effect. How much are you willing to put in to make it work? Because a lot of people have ideas, but this is what separates the ideas from the successful businesses that are out there, is the amount of resources you're going to dedicate to it. And there, you know, we'd all like to hit that home run right out of the chute. Uh, some people get lucky. They have a stroke of genius and it just hits. And then others, uh, like me, just got to work and work and work at it. Um, so. I have no idea who this little girl is, but I did find a picture years ago. Uh, I did get permission to use it, although we're not publishing it. Um, she's squatting there next to a campfire, and she has in her hands what are called pie irons. If anybody's been camping or have ever used a set of these, you can buy them at Dick's Sporting Goods for 15 bucks. They have the aluminum ones, which are cheaper. I'd recommend getting the cast iron. Cast iron is always better to cook with. So what you do with these is you make a fire, you put those irons in them and you let them heat up. Now this idea was started in the early 1940s by the Boy Scouts of America. And for Christmas last year, my son who lives in Chicago found an original pair of these irons and I really forgot to bring them in here today, but they're, they're at my office at the store. Uh, they they're similar to these, but completely different. They got the Boy Scout logo cast inside them, the whole nine yards. So Boy Scouts used to do these back in the 40s. 
And then as Boy Scouts got out of the Boy Scouts, they went camp with their families. The industry started growing, growing, growing. If you Google mountain pie, you'll be surprised at how many hits come up. If you Google pie iron sandwiches, you'll be surprised how many hits come up. But the only people that really ever heard of them or know what they are are the people that have camped or have gone around, uh, sat around campfires. So what you do is you take two slices of bread, butter the outside like you're making a grilled cheese, you put in anything you want. Now around a campfire, especially I've been camping all my life, we did pepperoni pizzas, we put pizza sauce in right out of the jar, pepperoni right out of the pack, mozzarella cheese right out of the bag, close the irons together, they connect right there, the, you see the male female lug there, they connect, they pivot close, throw them back in the fire for a couple minutes. Uh, this is where the tricky part comes around. One, you're dealing with a flame, and a, a, a wood fire, which, you know, from a pure engineering standpoint, from the time you light that fire, it heats up and it cools down. That is it. There is no leveling off. It's either getting hotter or it's getting colder. Number two, you're sitting around a campfire if you're a proper age, you're usually drinking beer when you're making these things, okay? Or in my case, Captain and Coke. You put those in the fire, after the irons are already heated, you literally have like maybe a minute or two to flip them over, give them another minute or two, and get them out. And if you don't, they don't look really good when they come out. But typically, if you're right on top of now my mom used to do it when we were kids, because she didn't drink, and she spent very little time talking around the campfire, because she was like making pies, making pies. But she also had six kids that were hungry. Um, so I had this idea, this great idea, uh, when my mom and dad had their 50th wedding anniversary back in 2008, my dad, who was in Korea, when he got out in, in the early 50s, he was stationed in Fort Lewis in the state of Washington. And he would go uh, fishing in the Puget Sound. He'd come home to PA to visit his parents. He went to a dance with his buddies. He met this lady, fell in love that night. He went back to Tacoma, got all his stuff, came back to PA. And a few, he wanted to get married in two weeks. Well, she wanted a spring wedding, so they got married in May, uh, literally five months after they met each other. So for, his 50th, for their 50th wedding anniversary, I had this cool idea. Why not uh, rent this tricked out motorhome, this big RV, and drive him back to Tacoma to go fishing? So it was on that trip, we, I, I took a month off from my company, and we trekked all the way across the country and all the way back. We got to Tacoma, we spent a week there camping, fishing. But it was on that trip, we were making mountain pies at every stop. So one night I said, Dad, I got this brilliant idea. He goes, what? And I said, how about a restaurant that sells mountain pies? So the first thing I showed him was the logo, and uh, without the name and the established date on there. He said, Gary, it's a great idea. I'm an old man, go to it. I said, well, you, you could be a part of this. He said, Gary, it's a great idea, go to it. He said, I'm old, he said, but I, I love the idea. So I sketched out the logo. Um, the Twin Peak Mountain is for the word mountain. Uh, and then if you look inside the mountain, you'll see the pie symbol from uh, your high school math days. Every March 14th, which is National Pie Day 3.14, we sell our dessert pies for $3.14, okay? <laughs> Not meant to be a, a, an advertisement in every, any uh, way, but just letting you know that the logo uh, was the first thing I sketched out for people. Came back home, I showed it to my brother who, uh, who lived in PA at the time. He left his job, his wife left her job. They moved their family to Ohio and he spent two years here helping me kick off the idea. Uh, he lives now down in uh, Myrtle Beach working for a drug company. Now, this is where the real work started, okay, because I had this idea, it's like make a, or develop a restaurant that makes these mountain pies or pie iron sandwiches. So then you really quickly start, which sandwich? Well, the only thing we ever made was pizza and fruit pies, you know, apple pie filling and things like that. Well, we weren't going to survive or have an ongoing concern business just by making pizza pies and apple pies. So I hired a chef who worked for uh, uh, Viking Appliance down at Legacy Village at the time. So his name was Adam, he came in, and for six months, we made mountain pies in my house every Wednesday night for six hours. And we were bringing in chicken from everybody, we were bringing in steak from everybody, pulled pork from every, every supplier we could get product from, we were bringing in different pizza sauces, different cheeses, everything. And uh, after six months of this, every Wednesday night, we had a, a menu of ingredients. And then I started inviting friends over, family when they were in town, and I would make these mountain pies, have them test them out, and we, really, we did some tweaking after that, you know, for the next few months, and then I figured, okay, the menu's locked in, I know we have something good here. Then, the process decision. Um, 
As I mentioned earlier, product consistency is key. This is typically what one of these look like when you're drinking beer, sitting around a campfire without a timer on, and you just shove it in there, and then somebody, after five or 10 minutes, say, oh, isn't that pie in the eye? So you bring it out, you dump it out, and that's what it looks like. It's burned, you don't, I mean, it tastes like it looks, okay? The insides are vaporized, there's no moisture anymore in the pizza sauce, the cheese is just shot, the pepperoni's just frizzled up to nothing. Um, and then we'd all clamor about how good they were, okay? Uh, which was directly proportional to the amount of beer, rum, and coke we had. <laughs> so product consistency is key. Anybody that's traveled around knows that you can go to a restaurant that's a national chain, eat at this one in this country, or this state, go to this one in this state, and if it's a national chain, chances are the consistency is going to be there, okay? Um, I used to travel a lot for Stride Tool. I spent a lot of time in Asia, back and forth to China every six months for a couple years, all over Europe, and I could tell you, I, every time I traveled to a new country or an area within a country, I went to McDonald's. Every time. I was looking for that consistency. I wanted to see what does it taste like over here. And I was am amazed at how a Big Mac in the Pudong region of Shanghai tastes exactly like the Big Mac that I would have on Mayfield Road in Lyndhurst when I used to eat Big Macs. But uh, product consistency was key, and the whole restaurant was going to live or die based on that. These are pie irons and a fire that uh, one of our camping trips. And as I mentioned about the heating element, okay, from a fire standpoint, it's either getting hot or it's getting cold. That's it. It doesn't get to a certain temperature and stay there for you. It's not that nice. Wood is burning. It's rapidly burning. It'll slow into hot embers, but even the embers themselves are cooling, cooling down. So I was thinking if I wanted to make a restaurant that did, did these or made these items, the whole key was going to be developing a piece of equipment or finding a piece of equipment that could make these. And then I searched and I searched and I searched and came to the conclusion it did not exist. It had never been done before anywhere in the world. Nobody had ever made these before. Now there are machines that make the Uncrustables, I think Smucker's owns uh, that, okay, the different element. What we were talking about here was literally building it a fast casual that you would walk up, pick your ingredients, and then we would put it together. It wasn't made on an assembly line and shipped you know, to a freezer section at a grocery store near you. So then, the process of coming up with this idea, first thing I did was commandeer our fireplace at home, made this little stand, went up to Home Depot, got a rotisserie, made this bracket and put a pie iron in it just to test, okay, if I had more of a controlled flame that was the same temperature the whole time, what would I get? Well, it gave me some promising results, but what I didn't uh, figure, figure in for was like the HVAC, or not the HVAC, the um, uh, exhaust system over a hood, as soon as that thing kicks on, there is a draft. Flames will be blowing all over the place. Um, it did give me more of a consistent product, so the next step I took was to come up with a fancier flame version with multi-units, so that's a six-station unit. You can't see, I, I, I didn't want to bore everybody with the detail, but there's a lot of valving and piping going on here where the flame was going to be really tightly controlled relative to the fireplace you see on the left. I would actually shoot these flames in, there were temperature probes, the whole nine yards. The very expensive prototype that sat on my deck for two years. It was great for making mountain pies, but it wasn't going to be a business uh, uh, useful tool for business. So then I said, what if I go with electric? Um, so then my wife came home one day to find out the two burners on her stove were missing. <laughs> I, I took those out and I opposed them, so, uh, one up this way, one upside down, put the set of power irons in between. I made this all down in a shop in my basement, just bending up strips of aluminum and stuff and wiring. And, and I made it, and the pie came out golden brown with rings on it, <laughs> just like you would imagine. Um, cast iron is funny that way. You have to heat up cast iron very slowly. So I heated it up really hot, and it had the hot rings and then the cold areas inside the annular rings. But the areas that were uh, browned were nice golden brown. I said, okay, now I'm on to something here. Um, so then the next prototype I made was... Uh, I found a company in Detroit that made infrared heating elements. Again, not getting into too much detail here, but they're ceramic plates, basically, is what they are, okay? If you look at all the grills that they're making today, very few of them, when you open up, have flame shooting. I mean, you look in there, there's a, like a, a grid in there, a ceramic plate or a metal plate. That's cooking with infrared, okay? So you heat up something, a plate of some sort, and then that heat is what's heating your food up, okay? Um, 
So I found this company, and at the same time, one of the other problems that go on with these irons is I'm thinking, okay, we're not going to just make pizza and, and apple pie. If I'm really going to blow this thing out and be fast casual, we can have people coming in here stacking all kinds of stuff in. Well, when you have those irons that pivot like that, um, when you stack a, pot, stack a lot of ingredients, you go to close it, it's pushing the top slice of bread off. Getting back to the product consistency issue, I realized that if we close that and shift that slice of bread, it's not going to seal the right way. So then I abandoned the pivoting and started going to more of an open and close. So what I had on the left here, on the left here was, a, was a, basically a mechanical press that I made out of wood. On the left, so I had this slider mechanism. You'd open those irons, uh, which I ground off the hinge, put the sandwich in there, put the other iron on top, and then push that piece of wood down, and that's what crimped it. Then I'd take the sandwich out of there and put it in the other set of irons where it's heated. And I knew that wasn't going to work in, in, in a, a restaurant environment, but it did prove the point that they grilled nice and consistently. When I had that plate, it heated up the entire iron, and they came out looking beautiful. So then I had to get rid of the two-stage process, went to the one-stage process. You can't see any of it here. That's a countertop unit. And then the last one that I came up with is the one that I still use at home. It's air cylinder driven up and down. I had a video on here, but for some reason, when the video started playing, it turned 90 degrees, and everybody in here would be looking like <laughs> So I took the slide off this morning. Um, but that was the final prototype unit that I made there. I had the menu rounded out from the chef. I had the, the press developed, and then it was a matter of just bringing this all together. So the final press that we wound up with that sits in the store today is this unit here. Uh, it's probably uh, about the size of this black wall right here when you get up to it. It's a six station unit, um, air cylinder operated up and down, and on the back side are all the controls. Okay, so here I was $60,000 later for developing this thing, getting the patents on it, and then getting UL approval. Because I knew I was going to need a UL approval, but the first thing I did was start meeting with these different malls, Mentor Mall, Legacy Village, Beach, Beachwood Place, South Park Mall, and you go to City Hall first, and they're all telling you, don't even talk to me until you have UL approval. Now, for our products in the previous companies I worked for, we had UL approval. You have to send a bunch of prototypes to them for destructive testing. Um, and it costs about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for all the testing. So I contact UL. I said, I can't send you a bunch of these. I only have one, and it's in my garage. So they have a program where they'll come in, and they do a one-off. Okay, it's called a field uh, certification. So they come, on, they come in. They spend three days really testing the heck out of it. And then we finally got UL approval on it. So at that point, we had the ingredients, we had the uh, press, and then we had all these startup hurdles to overcome, okay? Uh, this was a second faux pas with my presentation because I wanted these bullets to come in one by one. They did on my Mac at home last night, but on a Windows-based system, it just took my animation effect out. So um, cost, first and foremost, um, a lot of people underestimate what it's going to cost to get something like this off the ground. And not only till you open up, but keep it going until it gets legs. And like I tell my wife, you know, I said we can just afford to be stupid or much more than a lot of people, <laughs> you know, much longer. Because we pump money into this after we open, subsidizing rent, payroll, whatever you need to do. So while the sales were growing, but, you know, you, you look forward to that break-even point where you're not putting money into it, and then you look forward to that point where it's making money. Um, cost is a huge one. I talked to banks, it's a new idea, never been done before. It's not like walking in saying I'm gonna open up a franchise of Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's. Okay, they're tripping over each other to give you money because they know those places make money. They generate cash flow from day one. Um, a startup, well, I don't know if that's gonna work. I've never heard of it before. You know, all these other excuses. So I talked to five different banks, finally had to go home and tell my wife, if we're gonna do this, we gotta put the money into it. Gary, go do it, she says. So I did it. Location, I started really tightening down on scouting location. Um, rent becomes a big issue. I looked at uh, Beachwood Place, which was like two miles from my house, and they wanted twelve to 14000 a month for a space not even the size of this room per month, per month. Now, I'm sitting back thinking, if I do 100000 in the first year in sales, I'll be lucky. There's no way I can afford 150000 180000 a year in rent and pay all the other bills. Uh, so I started looking at Manor Mall, Small food court, uh, not many people. Great Northern Mall, the one spot that I wanted that was available, an Inferno Burger came in right when I was looking at it and they got the space. I think they were there like a year, year and a half and then they were gone. Um, 
Then I looked at South Park. Unbeknownst to me, South Park Mall was in the uh, midst of being sold. So South Park was Westfield property, which owned it at the time, was looking to fill every nook and cranny of available space. And I just happened to come in right at the right time when they had one spot left in that food court that really wasn't good prime real estate in the food court, but it was available and it was cheap and they gave me a hundred grand towards the build out, which basically covered the HVAC, the gas, the water, the drainage and things like that. And then I paid for the rest of it. Um, so I got lucky with that. Although it's the worst location in the food court because you walk in the front, we're all the way in the back on the right. And uh, it's amazing we sold as many of these, of these things as we have being at location. But location is critical when you're doing something like this. And I was like, I'm either gonna go on Mayfield Road, Pearl Road, Royalton Road, one of the busy roads, and then I gotta spend a ton of money to get people to pull off of that road into the parking lot, get out of their car on a cold, blustery day and walk in and try a sandwich. Or I can go to a mall with heavy foot traffic, pay nothing in advertising, and just benefit from the people that are walking by. Um, so that's the way I decided to go. Then you get into the store design. You can't go to the city hall in, a, uh, in any city, submit building plans that you did by yourself. Unless you're a certified architect, they won't accept them. So I started interviewing arch architects, told them the look that I was after. I wanted more of an upscale lodge look. I didn't want to look like fast food. We are fast casual. Settled on an architect, 40 grand right off the bat just to get the plans for the whole place done. And I'm thinking, wow. And I budgeted like 15 or 20, way off the mark on that one. Once more, I go back to my wife and I said, here's what it's going to do. Gary, go do it. So, so I did it. And so I got the, got the architect hired. Um, and then that took about four or five months to get all the plans designed. Right at the time that we had plans approved by Westfield Property, they sold the mall. Okay, literally right before we got final approval. New mall ownership came in Starwood Retail out of Chicago and said, you can't have this, you can't have this, you can't have this. So we had the menu screens. Uh, originally, they were just the, the placards that you would slide in front of the fluorescent lights, you know. Uh, they said, no, everybody in our uh, portfolio uh, has to have live menu screens, digital screens. That added 15 grand to replace the placards that I had with a digital screen build out. Then they told me, I can't have this. You got, your exhaust hood cannot be stainless steel. It has to be wrapped in something. And then they gave me three choices. The cheapest one was a hammered aged copper. So I went with that, but it added five grand to the cost. This is all due to ownership change, mind you. Okay, nothing else, but they sold them all and they had a different set of criteria than the first one. They changed the tile on me. They changed the countertops on me. They changed the requirements in the back of the house, everything. All told, it cost me almost 40 grand just from an ownership change at the mall. Um, so that was critical. We kept on plugging forward, as Winston Churchill once said, when you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> um, so we got this store design done. The build out comes along. We ran into hurdle after hurdle with the, the drain. We were right above, uh, if you know where the food court is, it's on a second floor. Why anybody would put a food court on the second floor of a mall, I don't know. With all the piping and drainage, we had to cut through Forever 21 underneath us. And Forever 21 is not an easy company to deal with. So automatically, we had to shut down their store. After they closed at 9 o'clock, we had to barricade. We had to have two armed guards hire uh, policemen, not security, but policemen. Had to pay labor time and a half. They had to come in there, pay people to move their uh, clothing racks out of the way, get into their ceiling, start cutting drain, work for eight hours at time and a half, put it all back. I had to pay the security guards. I had to pay the armed guards. I had to pay the labor for putting stuff back. And then a cleaning crew would come in and vacuum up the place. And I had to do that for six nights in a row just to get a drain pipe cut in. So you run into all these little issues that you don't foresee in the beginning. And each one is just racking up cost after cost. And that's what I mean. You get to a certain point, you either pull the plug on it, or you say, you know, we just got to swallow it and keep going forward. Um, operational flow. We set up a, a path in my kitchen. We had tables set up, little colored containers representing the different ingredients, and then other containers representing the sandwich. Because one thing, if you notice about these sandwiches, when they come out of the press, <laughs> they all look alike. Okay, so if you get that sandwich messed up, you ordered a pizza pie and you bite into it and it's chicken, you're not going to be happy, vice versa. Okay, or if you're allergic to mushrooms and you just bit into our Mountain Vesuvius pie, which is nothing but mushrooms and zucchini, we got a problem. Um, so operational flow was critical. So we were looking, my brother was involved, my wife was involved, the chef was involved. 
And we were setting up all these things, and it became more and more complicated. We're looking at touchpad screens, iPads here and here, and digital printouts and stickers. And then we finally came to the conclusion, you know, we're making this too hard. So we wound up with just deli paper and a permanent marker we write on there. So anybody that's been to our store, that's why we write the, the order right on a paper, because that paper gets married with your sandwich at the point of sale, and it follows all the way back through into the boat when you pick up your tray with a sandwich on it. Um, there was no other cost-effective way to do it than a permanent marker writing on paper. Um, and then you got new hires. Anybody here ever hire kids today? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can't raise somebody else's kids, okay? I found that out. So when they come to us, you know, it's a result of parenting. So we get them in there and, you know, we're screening these people and, and I interview them first. I screen them out, I get the top four candidates and then my wife and I tag team them, interview them again, scare the hell out of them about what we're looking for, what we will and will not tolerate. And if you think you can work for two highly strung, tightly wound owners, okay, <laughs> you're our guy or, or lady. Um, so we did our first round of hiring, and actually my wife wasn't involved with the store at the time. Her mother was living with us. She was on hospice, so she was tending to her. So it was me and my brother out there at the store, and these kids are coming in. They, they would interview well, and then they would get in the store, and uh, I could only imagine what their bedrooms looked like. <laughs> you know, something would fall on the floor. They left it there. You know, come on, it's a chunk of chicken. Get it? Get a paper towel, pick it up, throw it in the garbage, wash your hands, and get, grab a broom. broom it. The concept was lost. So these new hires, we went through the whole high school thing, and where we wound up was the 19, 20, 21-year-old range that are going to community college, either, uh, either Tri-C or Baldwin-Wallace right down the road. Completely different set of individuals. You know, the, the maturity is a lot different. They don't have all the drama that high school kids have, and high school kids have a lot of drama these days. Uh, from their battery dying on their iPhone to using their iPhone instead of paying attention to a customer that's in front of them. Um, and I realize that's part of who they are, but, you know, short of saying the cell phone stays in my office, do your job, okay, then you've really got to clamp down on them on, you know, on the maturity side. Say, so, you know, this is your time, okay, when you're on your phone, you know, you're on your break or you're not here, but when you're here, it's my time. Um, so you go through that whole thing with these hires coming in there, and you know, then you know, my car wouldn't start, my boyfriend broke up with me, my girlfriend broke up with me, you know, my boyfriend's girlfriend has a problem. I mean, it's just, it's just on and on, and I'm like, man, it's just a lot of drama that came with it. So we've, we're, we're at a point now where um, the employees that work there tell people you know, what it's like to work for us, and people, there are actually people that come here, I want to work for you. And then there are other people who are just scared to ever walk in the door and apply to work for me. Um, these were some of the issues we went through that, that, you know, when you take two engineers that have been in a professional environment, working professionals, working with degreed individuals, you know, in an office environment, and then you go into retail, it's a completely different change. And that was one of the biggest things that we didn't anticipate when we got into it was the uh, uh, difference in opinions, attitudes, and so forth, work ethic that we would get when we went into the pure retail side. This is the final, well, it's hard to see with the, with the lights, but this is a final look at the store, um, with, what we settled on down there. More uh, natural earth tones, use of stone, use of granite. Um, you can see the, the exhaust hood that's wrapped in copper. I think I'm the only one that has a wrapped exhaust hood uh, in that food court. My digital screen's back there rather than the plastic placards. Um, but this is what we wound up with, and we are nestled down there right next to Mitchell's ice cream. So when you look at the whole concept, and, and you, you get to this point on opening day, and you're thinking, wow, all the work is done. You know, we just worked my ass off for three years. You know, getting to this point, I was running a company, doing the beer thing back in Pittsburgh four nights a week. Um, illnesses in the family that we were dealing with. And we got this place launched. Now I can relax. And that's when the real work started at that point. This was, getting it to this point was nothing in retrospect. Because um, a lot of people, you open up and you're thinking, okay, am I going to sell 100 sandwiches in the first month or am I going to sell 1,000, 5,000? I don't know. I know we had a good product. I was doing no marketing. I was doing no advertising. Zilch. Other than the two signs on the floor in front of the store, okay, just advertising what we did or what the special was, okay. 
that was it. I figured if this thing was going to get legs and if it was going to run, it was going to run on its own accord. Okay, you can sell the sizzle all you want. Okay, the steak is what's going to get a customer to come back the second time. So uh, fortunately for us, uh, we got a sort of a cult following in the beginning. A lot of mall employees started eating there. Um, and these mall employees are tapped into other mall employees and their friends on the outside. And then when they come in over the weekend with their buddies or their girlfriends or their families or something. So it started a grassroots movement with the mall employees and then it grew from there. Um, and then when you get a line there on a Saturday afternoon or Friday night or Sunday afternoon, you know, a line means must be good, must be doing something right. I'll try it out. Uh, so our number one demographic through all of this um, is not black, white, male, female, tall, short, skinny, fat, nope. Our number one demographic is people looking for something different other than fast food. And when you walk into that food court, it's all fast food. There's us and there's Panera, okay? And they're right across the food court from us. Um, but I figured I wasn't gonna put money into marketing and advertising and mail out a bunch of mailers to every household in Strongsville, because if most of you are like me, I get the mail and on the way into the garage, I stop at the dumpster for the recyclables in the garage, garbage, 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 and then I go in with the bills or anything that I really need to keep. Other than that, I don't read a lot of stuff. I don't have time, and I very rarely go out anymore. So for me to send out mailers to everybody's house at the cost of five to $6,000 a month wasn't gonna do it. And I figured we'll just save the money, we'll open up the store and let the product speak for itself. So we're here three and a half years later, and the, uh, the I don't know what else I have up there, post-startup hurdles that I was talking about, um, this is what it comes down to when after we opened up our doors. Number one, staying funded, keeping doors open. Substation, uh, they have a location downtown. They opened up one right next to us in the, in the food court. Um, they were there eight months, and they closed their doors. And the guys, the brothers that owned it just said, we're not doing enough business here. And they had really good, I don't know if you refer to them as gyros or gyros. Uh, they were really good. They did corned beef, was really good. So they had two items that nobody else had in the food court. Um, for some strange reason, they decided to go after Charlie's with their grilled uh, Philly steaks. So they had a Philly steak, and they were trying to compete on price when their cost was much higher. So they were selling Philly steaks, but they were losing money on them instead of focusing on the two items that nobody else had in the food court. So my, my approach was, you know, we have a hook. We have something unique. We have something different. It's fast, casual, all natural flatbreads is what we use, and we grill everything right in front of you. Okay, it's not anything done mystery-wise and coming out of a chute when we're done making it. You can watch the whole process if you like. You can add spices as we're making it, whatever you want to do. But the staying funded part, you get into this thing and you're saying, okay, we might need X amount of dollars per month to keep this thing going for a long time. Now with mall traffic, okay, most of you probably don't go to the mall every week or at least the same mall every week. And when you do go, you may not be eating every time you go. So we're here three and a half years now down at South Park Mall and still 90% of our sales, okay, every day are people trying us for the first time after three and a half years. So the good and the bad of that, 10% of our sales are repeat business. The other, the, the really good part is the market size is huge out there. We haven't tapped into anything yet compared to what we sold and the amount of new people coming in, which is why the uh, Asian restaurants there are always pushing their samples when you walk in. They gotta figure it out, okay? They know every day somebody walks in this mall, they haven't tried our food. And they're just shoving the sample, sample, sample. Hey, try orange chicken, try orange chicken, you know? Uh, all three of them, whether it's Japanese or Chinese or Thai, they all have orange chicken. Or on Thursdays, they all have bourbon chicken. Hey, try bourbon chicken, bourbon chicken, bourbon chicken. <laughs> so, um, but they push the samples, and people, you know, being what they are, they try that sample, and they must feel like obligated. Okay, I'm going to eat here. It's not bad. It's $6.99 with double meat. I'll just eat here. Um, so we got to wait for them to get past that and down to us, okay? Because uh, we're right at the end of what we refer to as Asian Row with all the Asian restaurants on it. And then there's a Subway and a um, uh, Taco Bell as well. And then on the other side is Panera and everybody else, Charlie's, Mr. Hero, McDonald's. So we're the brand new brand with a product that nobody's ever had, a name they never heard of, and a process they've never seen. Tucked way back in the end of the food court after you get past all the samples. So you could see the hurdles that were, after, or that were in front of us. We knew that going in, okay? Um, Staying funded is so critical 
to just keeping the doors open, because like I said, a lot of restaurants go out of business because they are not funded. A lot of businesses go out of business because they can't keep it funded until, until it's got legs of its own. Building brand awareness is what we spend most of our time on. We engage consumers. They come down, they slow down in front of our store. Hello, have you been, have you been here before? Nope. Let me show you what we do or tell you what we do. Um, nine times out of 10, when we engage, they buy, okay? But it's not one of these things, you open the door and they will come, or you build it and they will come, okay? Because when it's new, there's a fear factor that comes with the consumer. I don't know. Our, our biggest validation is when we're busy and we got a line of people 10, 20 people deep, okay, more people tend to get in that line. They don't care how long they're gonna wait. It must be good. There's a line. They don't have a line. They have a line. Must be good. Um, so we love that. But those are the two things and I put on our lather, rinse, repeat, because you stay funded, you build a brand. You stay funded, you build a brand. You stay funded, you build a brand. Okay, now we, we've crossed that line some while ago from, you know, uh, me subsidizing it to breaking even to making money. And we're three and a half years into it. And, you know, we're, we're growing nicely. We're up about 40% this year, okay? I cut my target to 20% next year just to be ultra conservative to see what would it do. And then next year will probably be the time when I start talking to investors about rolling out more stores or going into franchising or things of that nature, okay? So the final shot here, these are some of the earlier sandwiches that we made. Um, the bottom left there is our pumpkin roll cheesecake. We offered that for a limited time. But you can see the difference in these versus that burnt thing that I showed you early on. Now the difference uh, from today to what you see here is we have now switched over to all flatbreads. So they're round. The sandwich still comes out the same shape, okay, but we're starting with all natural flatbread, either plain, whole wheat, or Italian herb. I had a baker that was making this, uh, Berlin Bakery down in Berlin, Ohio, because the bread was super big. I designed the bread pans because I wanted something much larger than what you would normally get in a sandwich. Um, they were doing a pretty good job and then we started getting busy demanding more of their time. They didn't really want to focus on us. They wanted to sell their own stuff. So we kind of separated and that was our opportunity to try flatbreads. We brought them in, they tasted out very well. And so we converted all those over, okay? So even as time goes on, you think you have this whole thing locked down, you know, it is a work in progress. As you go along, you know, you respond to supplier issues, you respond to consumer taste, whatever it may be. So those are some of the final shots there. And I think my last slide is just a uh, thank you. It's my story and I'm sticking to it, okay? So. Do you have any questions? Okay, well, we're about five minutes over our, our normal time, but you know, this is sort of that uh, holiday time. And what I wanna do is I want to read something to you as our gift to, to you. <clears throat> and it's talk about making art. You probably think of art as painting, music, or interpretive dance. While those are certainly forms of artistic expressions, so too is crafting a world-changing mission statement, drawing out an awe-inspiring customer experience flow, or designing a gorgeous product development logistics plan. Oxford Dictionary defines art as the expression or application, application of human creative skill and imagination. The sounds, that sounds like what you do five days at least a week. Some call it work, but if done right, it's called art. You all are artists. You should change the title on your business card. It might currently say project manager, receptionist, vice president of whatever, or CEO, but it should simply say business artist. Even if you can't sing, dance, play the piano, or paint like me, you can still be the Michelangelo of your position, and you can use your daily job function as your creative expression. So your action for today, every morning you wake up after you have had your coffee, tea, or smoothie, you step to, the, to a blank canvas. Every day is a fresh start to make today your masterpiece. What will it be today? Every day you choose your art. Will your art today be bland, boring, and uninspired? Or will you make it vivid, provocative, and courageous? It's your choice. You are the business artist. The canvas is just blank.
A really successful guy <clears throat> I know once said, Picasso obviously saw his art as a business. I see my business as art, as should you. What words would you choose to describe the art you will make today? Proclaim it in, the, in your comments for today's vision.